Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. This has been one of the most exciting weeks I have seen politically. Today has been a fantastic day, so I'm not going to waste any time. I'm going to get right into what I have to say tonight. I have a full list of items I wish to discuss. I know I'm not going to complete them. That's how many things happened this week that we should all be discussing and be aware of. I'm going to start with today. Today will go down. Today will go down in the political history of this country as a significant one because it's a day when two Republican United States senators stood up to the President of the United States and said, no more Donald Trump. Stop. I'm talking about Senator Corker, who for the last couple of weeks has been battling with the president. But this morning they both went at it big time. And Senator Flake, uh, who announced today that he's not going to run for re-election, as Corker did a couple of weeks ago. Both of these men are not quitting because they're cowards. They're quitting because they know they can't do anything. Uh, the government of the United States is sliding into an abyss. Okay, it's a question of character. Our president has no character. He has not the ability to be president. He doesn't have the brains to be president. Uh, He lies all the time. This is wonderful for your children, isn't it? And I don't know how many other things he does. All I'm saying is two men stood up today. They're going to be blasphemed. They're going to have stones thrown at them. I I don't mean that uh, in the real sense, but you understand what I'm saying. Because in this country yet, I believe that if there were an election today, Donald Trump would win. He's got 30, 35 percent of the vote that's solid. It doesn't deviate. I can't believe it. These people stay with him. He picks up 15, 20 percent of the popular vote, the independent vote, rather, and he's president again. The man is trouble, my friends. Did you think a year ago you might be facing a nuclear war with North uh, Korea? or maybe even Russia, a year from now could be China. Did you think you would be facing a war with a major uh, opponent, such as we are now, opponents with an S? Uh, Things are bad. Things are bad. He's bringing the country down. He has people around him who, who get on their hands and knees and kiss his feet, all right? He demands it. He requires it, or they wouldn't stay there. They are not giving him the advice he needs. And if they do give him good advice occasionally, he doesn't follow it. I see our country. I I haven't said this in a while, but I'm back to it now. It's Germany in the early 19 to mid-1930s. Adolf Hitler wasn't looked down upon at that time. The people loved him. He was bringing back the economy of of Germany. Uh, They looked upon him almost as a god. He was doing everything right. And they followed him. He was the Pied Piper of his time. Just like now, those who follow Donald Trump, he is the Pied Piper. Uh, And look what happened. (laughs) Ten years later, Germany was knocked to hell. The buildings were down. Hitler was dead. Uh, A major war. Millions of people killed. I think, I believe, I don't think, he is similar to Hitler. He, He draws attention to him. Hitler was crazy. He's crazy. I'm sorry, my friends who don't agree with me, but I've got to say it. People have to start standing up in this country. Now I want to go to, I'm going to stay for a while on government, our federal government, our president, our White House. That's what I'm going to talk about tonight primarily. I want to go back to October 4th, Niger. Whoever heard of Niger? We heard of Nigeria. Four American soldiers killed. In the last eight days, there has been a pissing match going on between the President of the United States, a a congresswoman from Florida, and one of the wives, a wife of one of the soldiers killed. He was David Johnson. His wife's name is Mishia Johnson. She is all of 23 years old, mother of two children, I think a six- and a three-year-old. And she also is six months pregnant. And the President's beating up on her. I mean... Can you believe it? Nobody's getting, the people that support Trump aren't even getting mad at him for this. They think he's doing the right thing. They don't believe this woman. They don't believe the congressman. I'm not going to go through the whole story. You've, you've 
been, you're getting beat up with it uh, on the media over the past several days. What I want to say is this. Trump does not speak the truth. Trump is a liar. Uh, and he also seems to compel or force those around him uh, to lie, to misspeak. And the most recent one, and I found this shocking, as you may have also, is John Kelly, retired Marine four-star general, uh, now chief of staff to the president. And what did he do? He went on television and said, oh, this, this, this congresswoman, she did this and she did that. I was there in 2015. Come, come to find out, he didn't speak the truth. He had the facts all wrong. Not one iota of what he said was correct. And he, of all people, should have created a scenario or told the president, you've got to be nice to this woman. My God, he lied and he lied. The two of them lied. He and he lied. All right. I'm going to tell you some more about Kelly in a few minutes uh, when I get to another phase of this, this story. Uh, let's talk about the military people in the Trump White House. I have always believed, and if you read history books, if you read books on government, they all tell you, you can't have the military running the government. Not our kind of democracy, republic, whatever you want to call it. We, we, uh, we are run by civilians. Yes, we have a great military force, naval force, air force, etc. But they are under the control of the, a civilian in each instance. That's the way our government is set up. And we just have too many military people at the highest echelons of this Trump government. Uh, and I'll tell you why it's wrong and why our government's set up to have civilians running it rather than the military, even when it comes to final major military decisions. They tell, they advise the president, the president makes the decision. He doesn't, fight, in this instance, the generals are the Pied Pipers, and Trump follows them as to whatever they say. And here's why. By education, by experience, military people are trained to fight. All they know is we fight. <laughs> Somebody bombs someplace, you go bomb them. Uh, a ship gets hit, you go hit their ship. This is what they do. Their education and their training is to do battle, not to step back and be a diplomat. Now, we're in a lot of wars. Do you know how many wars where I'm not, you know, the last, by the way, do you know what the last official war was for this country? World War II. World War II, because that's when the Congress of the United States authorized the president to enter into war. The Constitution says only Congress can declare war. Since World War II, we have, we, we have all these little wars. Well, Korea wasn't little. Vietnam wasn't little. But we let the president do what he, what he wants, and Congress never steps in and says, well, wait a minute, this is our power you're usurping. Uh, they passed a law or two saying under certain circumstances a president can go to war without their authorization. But it's only for a 60- or 90-day period. When's the last time we had a 60-, 90-day uh, conflict with another country? Well, let me tell you what the number is. The number of countries where we have boots on the ground, where we have soldiers, is 134. You heard me. 134 countries. You didn't know there were that many in the world, did you? They're either in combat, they're there on a special mission, or they're training. Now, Trump likes military people because they're hard-ass. Uh, they're disciplined. They lack mental flexibility. They do what their commander tells them. And who is their commander? Donald Trump. Okay. And this, and they're loyal. They are loyal. Look what, what Kelly just did to his reputation by the things he said about this woman, uh, this congressional woman, and everything else on TV last week. Now, who are these people? These are military people. We have too many military people at the top echelon of government. You've got John Ken, uh, Kelly, Secretary of Homeland Security, now Chief of Staff. James Mattis, Secretary of Defense. These people are all generals before. Michael Flynn, he's going to go to jail. He was a general. He was initially national security advisor. Uh, Mark S. Inch, he's director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. H.R. McMaster, national security advisor. Okay? And when we talk about John, K and oh, before I get to Kelly again, Mike Pompeo. He's the director of the CIA, Mike Pompeo. He's a West Point graduate. 
first in his class, only served five years, then went to Harvard Law, graduated first in his class, and since has been in practice with a big-time Washington law firm. He is... He was initially elected to Congress. He is a big man with the Tea Party and was a big man with the Tea Party when it was first formed. Now, let me go back to Kelly for a moment. When Kelly was secretary, well, let me start this way. People think Trump appointed Kelly chief of staff because when Kelly was secretary of uh, Homeland Security, he did exactly what Trump wanted and he did a good job. One of his primary functions is not the primary function that Kelly had at Homeland Security, okay? He oversaw the sweeping immigration raids. Yes, the raids on people who they thought were here illegally, okay? Uh, And he treated the people very harshly. He deported many without bringing them before a judge, put people in jail without bringing them before a judge. The man was harsh, but Trump liked him because he did what Trump wanted. And now he's chief of staff. Now, I don't know if that, he looks like a nice guy. I thought he was a nice guy. He talked sweetly and politely. But between what happened with uh, this recent military death this past uh, week or 10 days, and was it Niger? And uh, now having found out how he functioned as Secretary of Homeland Security, I think it's all a facade. The guy's not a good guy. He's not a good person. Now, we're heading for war. Don't tell me we're not heading for war. I hope it's avoided. I hope I am totally wrong. But this past week, President Trump signed another executive order. Now, he signed tons of executive orders. And you know how he signs these orders. He has the TV cameras there. He signs his name very large and very boldly. And then he holds it up for you to see the executive order with a signature on it. Well, this is not one an executive order where he wanted publicity or got publicity. He did not seek it. It was announced last week that President Trump, by executive order, okay, had, is ordering 1,000 pilots, 1,000 pilots to be recalled to service. These are retired military pilots back home with the family, in business, working for several years. They are being recalled. Because we are in, I told you, we're in 134 different countries with our military. We are in too many wars, and it looks like we're going to be in some more wars. And we don't have, we do not have enough pilots. And he's going to expand that number at some point. Let me tell you something else about my feeling we're heading for war. We are tiptoeing towards war. I will say it that way. At at the moment, we're tiptoeing. Where we will be next year at this time is another story. (laughs) This all happened in a matter of 24 hours, what I'm going to share with you now. It was announced. Uh, The B-52s were being prepared for 24-hour alert status. Now, what does this mean? Back when we were... uh, neck-to-neck with the Soviet Union until, what, 1990? Uh, From the end of World War II to uh, the the beginning, uh, to the end of the Soviet Union in 1990, we had constantly several B-52s flying around the world. Off the ground, they're flying, more than several, carrying nuclear weapons, nuclear bombs. They were flying around the coast of Russia. They were flying around the coast of wherever we thought a danger might come from us. Because if we thought Russia was going to go to war with us, these B-59s were close enough to get there first and do the damage first, okay? Now, we stopped having the B-52s on 24-hour alert, uh, as in the Cold War, in 1991. It was announced two days ago that we were now going to redo our B-52s and redo our crews so that they would be flying a 24-hour alert status. There would always be B-52s in the air with nuclear weapons. The next day, yesterday, this is wild, uh, General David Gatlin announced that was incorrect. (laughs) First, the Pentagon announces it, then they announce it is incorrect because There had to be a lot of, oh, my God, people said, are you crazy? What are you doing? We're tiptoeing towards war. That's what we're doing. But they denied it's true. We'll see whether it is or not. 
It's difficult to get soldiers. Why do you think we're calling the military back? Not enough people are signing up anymore. People are not renewing their tours of duty. They don't want to stay in the military. Do you want to go get shot up and lose a leg, both legs, both arms, get your face maimed, be a cripple for life? Do you want this? These are dangerous wars. These are more dangerous than the other wars we had. What can happen to the human body with the type of weaponry involved today? Okay? So, in order, and we don't have a draft, we don't have compulsory military service, we have a volunteer army. And we've been saying for years how proud we are to have a, mil- a voluntary army. And I've been against that too, but I won't get into my reasons right now on that. What I want to share with you tonight is this. In order to induce people to join the army, to enlist, our government pays bonuses. I'm sure you're aware of it, but you're not aware of the amount of money involved. If you go and you sign up, you can get a bonus for enlisting of anywhere from $5,000 to $40,000, depending on which area of work you sign up to do in the military. Now, that's pretty good. You go sign up and you get a sign-up bonus of $5,000 to $40,000. Now, if you not only sign up, but you're willing to ship out for training quick, you get another bonus, depending how fast you're willing to ship out. And, and this, is, this is in addition to your signing bonus, which is from five to $40,000. If you opt, you say, I will ship out in 30 days, you get a $20,000 bonus. You ship out within 30 days after signing up, you get a $20,000 bonus just for that. And if you do it within 30 to 60 days, you don't want to go that quick, you still get some money. You get an $8,000 bonus. Now, if a serviceman's retired and he reenlists, okay, and a lot of men do this because they find they can't make that much money outside. Life is different. They enjoyed the service. They get <laughs> a reenlistment bonus of up to $20,000. Now, why is the government doing this? The government is doing this because they don't have enough military personnel to fight the wars we are engaged in. Now, let's talk about the type of enlistees they're getting. The quality of, you know, the buck private, the guy who's signing up at the lowest level, is becoming poorer and poorer every year. Drugs are involved. For example, recently uh, the government said, hey, if you've got a marijuana pr- uh, problem, we're going to overlook it, okay? We, our government has lowered the standards for enlistment. They have lowered the standards for enlistment, and you go smoke all the pot you want, but we're still going to pay you that bonus of from five to $40,000, and if you go to work, you get in uh, to uniform within 30 days, another $20,000. Terrific. All right, now... I have said for the last 10 years, and I continue to say, we've got to have a draft or compulsory military service. I do not like a volunteer army such as we have today. Because I'm going to say something, you say it can't happen. You never know when these volunteer armies are going to fall under the thumb or the hand of someone who is not as democratic as he should be, and we're going to have the overthrow of our government with the military siding with this despot. Don't say it could happen. It happens all over the world. And we're not the shining country at the top of the hill now with all this stuff anymore. With all these things happening in our country, all the things we've done under Trump with other countries, we're, we're nobody, people don't look up to us anymore. We're not the shining tower, whatever it is, on top of the hill. And I've always said the way to resolve this problem for the last 10 years, I've been saying it, have a draft. You have a draft or you have compulsory military service. Everyone getting, once they get out of high school, they do two years military service. Many countries in the world do this. Israel does it. Now, why do I say do this? Uh, My primary reason is as follows. Back to, I remember World War II. I was a kid. I was only five to ten. But I remember how everybody had somebody in the war and everybody was concerned about the war and everything else. And this went on, by the way, with the Korean War also. Uh, I believe this, that if more of the populace, because I think the people enlisting are, are minorities, black, tan, more than whites, 
And if we have a fair system of bringing people into the service via a draft, colorblind, uh, more people on the outside, citizens, will have a member of their family in the service. And we will all become more war conscious because we all have a cousin, a brother, a sister, an aunt, or an uncle serving someplace. And once you do that, and the, the people, the people of this country become more conscious on a personal level, level, level of what is going on, we're going to have fewer wars. Do you think the president or Congress is going to vote to spend money on a war if the people really know what's going on, if they have someone they feel for that's in that service? No. And that's the way we'll be in fewer wars. Now, we have, besides our soldiers who are fighting, and we don't have enough of them, uh, we, we now have armed mercenaries. In other words, our government goes out and hires corporations that provide us with soldiers and equipment to go for help fight our wars. You don't hear about them too much. Well, Now, this past week, and I talked about this, it was the number one item on my show last Tuesday night, there are armed, masked mercenaries in Puerto Rico. Don't know who they are, don't know where they come from, they have no label, but they're walking around in uniform carrying guns, uh, and they have masks. Now, last week they were in San Juan. Today's news says they are expanding throughout the island, and we still don't know who they are, okay? They're spreading throughout the island. Now, what bothers me is you don't hear this in the news on TV. You see it rarely in the paper. Just, just two days ago, the Washington Post reported it for the first time. The Washington Post reported it for the first time. I haven't seen the Times do it or anybody else. Why they don't do it, I don't know. But that's what's going on, which leads me now to just talking about armed mercenaries, soldiers for hire. These are, wars are big business today. I don't have to tell you how much money everything costs, a boat, a plane, a gun. They are big business. And nations today, with an S, not just us, are paying mercenaries to be boots on the ground, to assist. You know who the two biggest users of mercenaries are in the world today? The United States and Russia. Putin's doing it also. For example, there was a meeting of the Trump administration, and not Donald Trump himself, but the Trump administration uh, going back into the summer. And at this meeting, this was in the White House, was Eric Prince. Now, Eric Prince was the founder of Blackwater, which was the first mercenary group. Then they got in trouble. They had a disband, changed their name. They're now Academia. I don't think he has an interest in that, but he still has an interest in other companies. One of the first things he did when he had a disband was go to Saudi Arabia and help train a, an army for them. Okay, now these are, these are light people. They got corporations. It's like corporate, corporate America is also running our wars besides running everything else. And the other fellow was Stephen Feinberg. He owns DuPont International, which is a giant military contractor. And the reason they were called in, these two gentlemen, these are big-time mercenaries, they were called into the White House for a meeting because we were having problems with our Afghanistan strategy. And our government wanted their advice as, how, as to how we should deal with Afghanistan. Okay, The meeting was arranged, and this was reported in the New York Times on July 10th, was arranged at the behest of Stephen Bannon and Jared Kushner. Okay? Uh, why do we do this? Well, we, put, we have armed mercenaries. One, we don't have enough soldiers because we don't draft them. If you draft them, you don't need mercenaries. Two, you never hear how many mercenaries got killed or wounded in any theater of war. They never publish that. It's nobody's business. It's not our business. And you don't know how much they're being paid because mercenaries are paid by the CIA, and it's against the law for anyone to know what the CIA pays for anything or even who they pay. So far, so good tonight. I, I like this show. 
I told you it would be good. Uh, I want to talk quickly about the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis was this week, in 1962, okay? It lasted one week. Uh, on the 21st, it began, October 21, 1962, missiles were discovered on Cuba. Russian missiles aiming at the United States were on Cuba. The next day, President Kennedy announced a blockade of Cuba. The uh, Soviet Union, their ships were bringing in the missiles. You know, and going between Key West and Cuba to leave the missiles in Cuba. Key West became the first line of defense uh, on the beaches at the Casa Marina. Smathers Beach, Higgs Beach, guns, missiles were all aimed at Cuba, just like that. We had soldiers dumped in here immediately. Uh, Now, Khrushchev was the head of the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, A pig. A bully. I'm going to tell you, a bigger bully than Donald Trump, if there can be one. This is a guy who was at the United Nations for uh, and was sitting in the General Assembly. He didn't like that what they were saying, someone from the United States. He stood up, took off his shoe, and slapped it on the desk. This is a man, when Nixon visited the Soviet Union, he said to Nixon, uh, we are in front of the news media, we are going to bury you. Ballsy. Anyhow, six, seven days after this thing started, uh, we had a boycott immediately. We, we were blocking the Russian ships from going to Cuba. Well, the shit hit the fan on the seventh day, and the Soviet Union says, we're going, and you're not going to stop us. And here, between Key West and Cuba, uh, it was on television. I remember seeing all this distinctly. Everyone watched television. The Russian ships were coming in with the missiles on them. They had warships also, and our warships were standing between them and Cuba. Who's going to blink first? Who's going to move and turn? We're heading for each other. Each ship can see each other very clearly. Then at some point, we shot one or two uh, guns, uh, bullet, not bullets, bombs across the bow of one of the ships. And that's the moment of truth. Either they were going to proceed or shoot back or they were going to turn around. They made, Khrushchev blinked. The Soviet Union, those ships made a 180-degree turn immediately and went back to Russia, and the whole thing was over. All right. Now, that was very dangerous. We were closer to war then than we are now with North Korea. You can see how close it was. Uh, It was inevitable. It was that day, (laughs) the seventh day, it was going to be war or not war. We're facing each other hundreds of feet apart, these these ships. Uh, Now, you must agree with me, I'm sure. Jong-un of North Korea is crazy. Trump's crazy. They're both nuts. There's no, I'm not exaggerating. You know I'm not. Khrushchev was crazy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The only one who wasn't was Kennedy. Well, we don't have Kennedy. We've got Trump, and he's a nut. And he, this guy's big mouth and the other guy's big mouth, they're going to get us in a nuclear war. Uh, well... That's the show for this week. I've got tons more stuff. Uh, it's because so many things are happening uh, this week, has, have happened this past week. I hope you've enjoyed. You don't have to agree with me. I only try to bring things to your attention. Uh, I want you to know also that i got a book coming out. I told you last week and the week before, Irma and me, about the hurricane and me. Uh, it's supposed to be out on the stands. The publisher hasn't got it out yet. I expect it any day. It's like waiting for a baby to be born. I'm, I, the other night I wanted strawberry ice cream, 3 o'clock in the morning. I hope you find that humorous. I'm also doing a live uh, Facebook video every day, two or three minutes. You might want to take a look at that. Other than that, thank you for joining me again. I look forward to being with you next week. Good night. And now, insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. It's a common expression, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. However, what if the horse's mouth is filled with useful insurance tools? This is the exact case with the GEICO app. Yes, the app is free and therefore a gift horse. However, look inside the app and behold, emergency roadside assistance, digital ID cards, bill pay. Get the GEICO app, look it in the mouth, get amazing services. Thank you.